Um, I think we will get started. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. This is the, uh, our session is about worker safety in the food supply chain during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Alyssa Layton. I use she, hers pronouns. I work at the Teamsters Union headquarters in Washington, DC. Um, the Teamsters have nearly half a million members who work in food processing and food warehousing and food distribution industries. Um, and as you can imagine, um, they have all been deemed essential workers um, during what has been an incredibly uh, dangerous and scary time. Um, we are going to short, uh, start off this session with a short video. Um, so you can hear from some of those who, workers who have been doing this work on the front lines. Um, you're about to hear from workers at a Cargill plant in Colorado at this facility. Um, they slaughter cattle, cattle and um, cut and package the beef at this facility. Um, there have been at least 100 cases of COVID-19 there that we know of, um, as well as uh, four deaths um, among their coworkers. Um, we are going to spend time today talking about uh, what we need to do to protect these workers and their families in their communities, um, as well as protect the food supply chain that over 300 million people in this country depend upon. So I will go to the video now. At the beginning, um, it was a very scary experience. None of us really wanted to work, um, but we, of course, had to work because we're essential workers. Nos sentimos como frustrados, tristes de lo que estaba pasando ahí en tu área de trabajo, porque no estábamos al principio al 100% seguros todavía y no teníamos la seguridad todavía al principio ni el conocimiento de qué tan grave era la, el virus que nos estaba contagiando en todas nuestras áreas. There was not a lot of social distancing, there were no facials, there was no mask in the beginning, um, so no. I did not feel 100% safe. So when this started, we know that people got infected, but we didn't know how to react to it. So as media and uh, information started getting out to the, to the floor and to us, uh, obviously we approached the company and, and what we're going to do, what's going to happen. And uh, the company then started to put people on quarantine. And by that time, people had already gotten infected. I became aware of that when I see like people getting their temperatures done and saying, hey, you have a high temperature, that person needs to go home. A lot of people um, getting sent home, um, a lot of people t saying that they, you know, they have a flu sort of thing, um, stuff like that. That's how I became aware that, you know, like people are actually really getting sick. At that time, people did go home and, you know, were tested and, and realized that they did have the virus. And some gave it to fa other family members. Some people did pass away. Some people died that were not workers at Cargill. So to the earlier questions, um, yeah, it affected the community. The union says one worker has died. A half dozen tested positive for the virus and 150 are quarantined. Angela says her friend, whose full name was A.A. Bian, came to the U.S. from a Burmese refugee camp in 2008. She worked at Cargill for about three years and the meat plant JBS before that. Angela says her friend never complained of respiratory problems the last time they spoke, when she passed away the next day. Te sí, conocí en los compañeros y este es unos frustró en el trabajo tanto compañeros y a mí. Nos dio tristeza lo que estaba pasando su familia en ese momento y fue una tristeza muy grande que tuvimos como compañeros en nuestra área. When uh, this pandemic started, uh, a lot of people uh, left, retired, quit, moved on because they didn't want to work here. Um, you know, you get the news of other facilities, similar uh, beef plants um, that were really getting infected. Um, people just 
decided to leave and that our numbers went down by about 400 people. So when there's 400 people out, you will notice because there's a lot of different job positions that need to be filled. And when there's nobody to do it, you, you know. So yeah, the shortage of people definitely affected every, everything. Um, the, the food shortage is very real. Since there were not a lot of people there and everybody was getting sent home, people were sick, some people just quit. Because of that, we weren't really able to provide for, for people to get the products that they did need to get their meat. Pretty much when, when people started to, to pass away, um, the company then did get a little more aggressive as to how they're going to deal with it. Therefore, they went down to one shift and they were working uh, staggered times and, and staggered breaks and just doing everything they can to limit contact. We got face masks, um, face shields. We got dividers in the cafeteria. Um, social distancing became more strict. Um, we got temperature testing, screenings. Um, more hand sanitizer stations. A lot of changes. When we went to the cafeteria, the company gave us a process of going to a group first and another group later to not have so much contact in the cafeteria, to have our own distance, and to the damages, and to give us warnings of how much distance we have to be in the area of the floor, or in the cafeteria, or when we are coming out of the park or we are in an area of the office. We have a lot more to do. So yeah, the company is doing something, but yeah, we asked they do more. And we have approached the company with providing testing. And I know I keep talking about that, but it's important that we really at least take the take a look. Let's go out there and see if, if that's even possible to provide testing for that many people or however much they need. But if we don't take that step, we don't know. What I do know is that people, you know, did put their lives in risk. It was serious. Um, and I, I'm not sure if it will happen again, but you never know. At the beginning, um, it was a very scary experience. Sorry about that. Sorry. Um, thanks. Um, and for our first speaker um, following the video, um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Keeve Nackman, who is associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, thank you for being here today. I think you're on mute. Thanks for having me, Alyssa. Um, can you see my slides? Okay, great. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk with you. Um, I'm gonna talk about the work that I and some colleagues have been doing at Johns Hopkins to develop a set of recommendations to protect food supply chain workers in the pandemic. I'm gonna try and advance my slides. Okay. so. Um, we all recognize that food and agricultural workers are, are critical, and without them, we can't count on having a safe and abundant food supply. Now, these folks constitute the largest uh, worker sector. Um, about 21 million people or more are, are active food and agricultural workers. Uh, so about one in seven workers in the U.S. actually works in this sector. So it, it's, it's an enormous uh, worker population. Um, we as a society have rightfully decided that food and agricultural workers are essential uh, to making sure we have a food supply. Uh, and as such, we require them to continue to work during the pandemic. They often usually can't work from home, have to be there in the thick of things, and they're really on the front lines. Um, so they really deserve uh, protection. Uh, and Based on what we've seen thus far throughout the pandemic, uh, these workers likely aren't receiving the protections they deserve. If you look at the figures on the right side of my slide here, you can see uh, the occurrence of cases over time 
in uh, all sectors of the food system. I think the most attention has been paid to meatpacking workers, and, and certainly there are a number of outbreaks in that sector. Um, but we see across other sectors of the food supply chain, there are also uh, outbreaks of the coronavirus. And, and uh, there have been documented uh, great numbers of cases and, and even deaths. Um, I, I'm showing some data from uh, the Food and Environment Reporting Network, and I've posted a link there if you're interested in seeing how case and death reports evolve over time. But the point here is that it's a vulnerable workforce who is, in fact, becoming infected and, and in some cases, dying. So even before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the food uh, and agricultural worker sector uh, faced high rates of injury and illness. Um, they often tend to be a vulnerable population in that these are very low paying jobs. Uh, they often require working for very long hours doing repetitive tasks. Uh, people who end up taking these jobs in many cases come from populations uh, that are undocumented. Uh, they may be vulnerable uh, to abuses in the workplace. They may have very little social and political capital that they can use to push back to advocate for their safety and, and other needs in the workplace. So even without a virus or a pandemic, uh, they're in a precarious situation. So adding coronavirus on top of their already challenging situation uh, dramatically worsens some of the fissures that already exist. Um, what we wanted to do at Johns Hopkins was uh, think through uh, some recommendations uh, based on, on current scientific information uh, as to uh, what these workers need in order to minimize their risks uh, from the coronavirus. Um, we wanted to think about what other leading public health agencies around the world and in the U.S. and, and uh, public health societies had recommended and kind of distill and synthesize them uh, for the agricultural context. So we are drawing upon recommendations from the World Health Organization, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the American Public Health Association to put together what we believe are, are things that should be done to keep these essential workers as safe as possible. Uh, given the current crisis. Uh, we are trying to reach, uh, in, in putting together this statement, governors, uh, local governments, uh, industry and labor unions, uh, because really successfully protecting workers requires a coordinated effort and funding um, uh, across these various parties. So our framework, which was put together by uh, myself and, and colleagues at the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, the Education and Research Center and the Jones Hopkins Department of Environmental Engineering is a, a four component plan. Uh, and I've put it here, it, it has a catchy acronym, STTT, for shield, test, trace, and treat. And I'm gonna quickly walk through each of those now. So the first is shield. Um, and this is based on a concept from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health of the CDC called the Hierarchy of Controls. And uh, this is a framework that's applied to any hazard in the workplace. Uh, and as you look at, the, at the, the image on the right, there are five different components to shield. Um, as you go from top to bottom, uh, things become less effective. And as you go from top to bottom, things become less expensive. Um, so unfortunately, in the case of coronavirus, we can't eliminate the hazard, we can't make the virus go away, and we can't substitute something less hazardous for the coronavirus. So those are, are off the table, unfortunately. But we can look at engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment to try and protect workers. So engineering controls are things that we can do to change the work environment to make transmission of the virus less likely. These are things like creating barriers, space workers further apart, slowing line speeds, and any other number of environmental changes we can have to reduce the transmission of virus. Administrative controls are things we can do like uh, staggered work shifts, planning breaks, doing things that reduce the contact that workers have with one another in order to reduce the spread of the virus. And PPE is the lowest cost but arguably least effective of the bunch, although still important and essential. And that's providing things like masks and face shields uh, on an individual basis to help stem the spread of the virus. So every workplace is unique. And so uh, uh, each workplace will have to figure out its own configuration of what can be done to minimize contact and minimize spread of the virus. 
So that's shield. The second component is test. And this is probably no surprise to anyone. Uh, regular testing is very important to try and catch people who might be asymptomatic, which means they're carrying and shedding the virus, but they're not actually feeling sick. Um, they're still capable of spreading the virus. And then pre-symptomatic people or people who have become infected uh, and will get sick, but are not yet showing symptoms, but may still be contagious with coronavirus. So regular testing is an opportunity to catch those people before they spread uh, coronavirus to others. Um, infrequent testing is really not going to be enough. You can't just test once and then stop. Really have to do testing at a regular interval. And that interval should be decided uh, collectively by the unions, by uh, the industry, and, and with uh, input from local health. Uh, and state health. Um, and in addition to testing, we also recommend screening where possible, which means using measures uh, like the thermal imaging screening system that I have here shown to the right, where we can actually look to see at, at a distance whether a person's developing a fever, or we could do uh, surveys of other symptoms. And people who appear to be starting to develop symptoms can be set, sent home before they have an opportunity to infect others. Trace is the next component of our framework. Uh, so when we do have a sick worker or a person later uh, starts presenting with symptoms, we need to go back and identify the other people that that person has had contact with and notify them that they should quarantine uh, and, and they should notify others uh, of their potential exposure. Uh, we need resources for these contact tracers. Um, it's not, it's not uh, free. Uh, and this also requires coordination uh, from the industry, from the unions, and from local government to make sure it's done properly. And it's critical to consider the privacy of persons participating and sharing information with contact tracers to protect uh, workers and their family members who may be undocumented and at risk of retribution or, or deportation as a result of being sick. Uh, just a quick plug, uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, we have launched a free course on the Coursera platform that anyone can take to learn the basics of becoming a contact tracer. So I think in the Google document that Alyssa has shared, uh, this link will appear there as well if you're interested. Uh, and then the last step of our framework is treat. So uh, when someone is sick, uh, they absolutely need to be sent home. Um, if they're just starting to develop symptoms, they need to go home. But what's important is that we need to provide people with the cover to go home. So they need to have access to health care and they need to have sick pay. They need to have financial support to make sure they can go home. We really don't want to put people in the position of choosing between going to work sick or not having enough money to pay rent or put food on the table or cover any of their other basic essentials. I mean, we owe it to these people. These people are, are, are working for us and putting themselves at great risk. So, so absolutely. Um, and employers should ensure that COVID related healthcare costs are waived and really have flexible sick leave policies. We, we need to not uh, keep workers afraid of, of recognizing that they're sick and potentially contagious. That, that is, is not good for anyone, not good for the employers, not good for the industry. So these are all, all critical components of a strategy to protect people. I, I do want to close by saying that there is no one silver bullet. It's not like this is a, a menu and, and you can pick one of them and that's enough. I, I think protection of workers really requires um, drawing from each of these four steps in a way that's that's uh, feasible and appropriate for the particular workplace um, and within resources. And more resources need to be made available to actually implement these steps. Um, it has to be a sincere investment. And, and frankly, this is a, a short-term capital investment that will pay dividends uh, if these systems are established and put in place, uh, not only financially, but in, in protecting the, the lives and the well-being of, of the workers we so dearly uh, rely upon for our food. Um, and beyond these four steps, I think ongoing monitoring and evaluation of, of the measures that are taken is absolutely critical to know what's working and what isn't uh, and where we need to intervene further. Uh, and with that, I will stop. Thank you, Keith, so much. Um, as, as you were speaking, um, I could really see and um, the faces of and hear the voices of um, the Cargill workers um, in that video while you were talking about the protections that are needed. So thank you so much. Um, the next person um, I want to introduce everyone to is Matt Brown. 
um, who works as a uh, strate strategic campaigner at the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. So thank you, Matt. Hey, everybody. Um, so yeah, uh, as Sister Layton said, I'm, my name is Matt Brown. Uh, I work for the Teamsters in our strategic research department. Um, before I get started my little presentation, um, I did want to uh, give a shout out to to Brother Andrew Laura. I think is in the in the room. He helped. He put that video together with the touching story out of Colorado. And I just want to say uh, it was really moving. Um, and thank him for doing that. Um, so uh, as Sister Layton said, the Teamsters represent about a half a million people uh, in the broadest logistics, uh, in the broad term that, that we call the food supply chain. We represent folks in the Salinas Valley who pick the vegetables. We represent the folks at the factories that package the, sa the, the vegetables in the salad. We represent the distribution centers that send it to the stores. We represent the folks at Costco who check it out. So from seed to table, there's, there could be a Teamster involved. That's why we are the union that needs to, to begin this discussion. Um, so here's when this crisis began, um, we reached out to our local unions across the country and asked them what COVID looked like. Alyssa, can you bring up the surveys? Here are the survey results in what we call the food processing center. These are plants like the Cargill plant you, you heard about. Well, okay, we can do this. Uh, yeah, here we go. And then in dairies, right? And again, this is at the very beginning of the outbreak, right? Um, we'll probably need to go back and, and see this again. So 40% of plants had confirmed COVID. 42% percent of employers are not doing any hazard assessments. 35 percent of employers are not practicing social distancing. 47 percent of employers are not waiving COVID health care costs. 50 percent of employers are not providing hazard pay. 26 percent of employers are not providing quarantine pay. Lack of employer provided PPE and the in-plant mitigation is a problem. Um, it, it, it's just, it's crazy. And then, and then as you move through this, in this uh, industrial sector, if we get into the grocery warehouse, you know, we did the survey there and the numbers are just as staggering. 34% uh, of facilities uh, have positive COVID. 24% of facilities are, are only 24% of facilities are in compliance. 75% of employers are not practicing social distancing. 50% of employers are not requiring masks. 46% of employers are not taking employee temperatures. 39% of employers are not cleaning the facilities. And 48% of employers have not changed speed requirements. And for those who aren't familiar, what a speed requirement is, um, is there's a production standard that says you need to pick up this many bags of chips and put them on a, on a crate, um, which, is fine, but if you can only have one person going down an aisle at a time for physical distancing purposes, you have to change those requirements um, because workers, you just can't work at the same speed. Um, so, and again, you, you can bring this down. Um, these are the facilities that have unions. So you think, at least in these places, these workers can stand up and have folks come to their aid. Think about it at the Amazons of the world, at the Walmarts of the world, at all the non-union places where these workers are subject to the employer's whim and don't have a voice for which they can stand up for themselves. So we, we can only imagine that the numbers get worse and worse. Um, so what our strategy, as, as the doctor said, is to is to go back to our history and we, we looked at what was a crisis similar to this. Um, and we thought of, of, of the Second World War, um, where the, the war effort had to gear up. So President Roosevelt assembled uh, labor and capital 
to sit together and come with war planning boards that would say, here's what we're going to go for, and here's the remedies in case there's problems, because we all have to be on the same foot. So that's, in that thinking, uh, we've developed a strategy um, to, to go to governors of states to set up uh, labor management panels to implement the STTT plan. And, and as that plan is developed in conjunction with workers and management and the government, um, obviously this is not cheap. Um, this is something that's, that, that does have a high cost. So we are going to, to collectively, that's labor management and local entities, lobby Congress to create grants for states that choose to adopt this plan. Um, some of the, the places that we've, we've had a lot of interest are uh, California, Colorado, Oregon, Wisconsin, um, and Virginia. Uh, so that's kind of what our Teamster plan is. Um, and that's, that's what we're moving towards. So that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much. Um, next, um, we are going to hear um, more about one state in particular. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jason Yarishez, who is an attorney at the Legal Aid Justice Center in Virginia, um, and who coordinates their uh, Farm and Immigrant Workers Justice Project. So thank you, Jason. Hi, thanks. Can you all hear me okay? All right, great. So uh, thank you so much for having me here. This is really an incredible group of panelists, uh, as well as everybody who's participating. Uh, tons of respect for everybody who's been in this movement for a long time. So um, as you noted, so I work with Legal Aid Justice Center, just very briefly in short, we're a Virginia organization. We partner with clients and communities to achieve justice by trying to dismantle a lot of these systems that create and perpetuate poverty. Um, so my team specifically, we organize in lawyer and advocate across Virginia, most particularly with rural um, communities, uh, immigrant workers and farm workers um, to try to do the same thing. Um, and I have been asked today to uh, discuss in nine minutes how to create the first enforceable COVID-19 workplace standard uh, in the worst labor rights state in the country. So uh, I will try to do that and uh, please cut me off if I start to go a little bit long. So the big picture here is I'll talk about broad context of what happened, um, forecasting what happened and how to go on the offensive as early as possible how this uprising happened in the community um, and to get coalitions on board on the front end. Once the government acts, how to seize the moment and then um, building the coalition once the, the government does act to come up with the inside game to actually get it passed. Um, so broad context here, as a lot of folks know, COVID hits. And then I think a lot of folks know is that the feds haven't been doing their job, right? Particularly in regards to OSHA and the CDC, there's a lot of recommendations and guidelines out there. And as Matt put up on the survey, and as a lot of folks know who work on the ground, uh, know that uh, recommendations and guidelines are one thing, but if they're not enforceable, then workers aren't gonna feel empowered to do anything. So um, we were just saying we, we need enforceability here. Um, and when that when it first hit one big thing that i think that we need to think about particularly as folks in the labor rights movement are always in the position of feeling like they're on the defensive i think we need to think about how we uh get more offensive and put things out early so we put folks in a position where they're responding to us as opposed to responding to them and particularly for essential workers this was an emergency, but really it was an emergency within an emergency for them because they're well, all, the, all the rest of us are going out and social distancing and isolating. They're being required to come into work to keep all the rest of us um, afloat. So we started to get op-eds out in local papers um, as well as statewide papers just to flag this concern to folks like this is your opportunity to be on the front end of this. And if you're not, history is not going to look uh, upon you favorably. And then what do we hear after that? We're, we're starting to get out there that there's no enforceable standards. We're starting to hear back from workers, like all these things that we've discussed, um, social distancing, no protective gear, et cetera. Workers start to reach out. We start to give complaints to Virginia and they come back and they say, look, there's no enforceable regulations on the books. We are uh, giving them a really egregious sets of circumstances. And so uh, they're coming back saying they can't do anything. And, and at the end of the day, they're right. 
So this starts to get workers, you know, really fired up, even in non-union plants, particularly given the urgency um, of the situation. And what we started to do was um, build in, we already have coalitions in rural areas, but we started to really build the coalitions out a little bit, given like in an ad hoc manner. So we had um, workers driving the movement as much as possible um, in solidarity, um, both union and non-union, as well as our legal and organizing team and amazing community partners um, across the ground, um, organizing partners, church leaders, folks of faith that are saying, what, what are we gonna do here? And, you know, I, I would say that there's some times uh, where we're diplomatically maneuvering uh, and there's other times where we just have to make, make big moves and, and know that we have to make an affirmative decision to just open the floodgates of advocacy. So we were giving petitions to the governor, getting loud about needing enforceable standards. We were sending out action alerts to folks and really, really making it easy because I think a lot of times with action alerts, there's a whole bunch of things you have to do. You have to find your congressional office, you know, figure out who it is one button click, get in, get the get a click that they can send immediately to the governor to make it easy for folks who are already busy. Then a big piece of what we did was to get creative in terms of our organizing. Organizing is difficult during the COVID, during any era, but most particularly during COVID. So just in short, one of the big things that we did, I think looking back was we held these big socially distanced car rallies in front of poultry plants. Um, we weren't sure how many folks were gonna end up showing up, but. We ended up having about 50 cars, both in the Shenandoah Valley and in the Eastern Shore area of Virginia, super rural areas. But, you know, folks came out across, uh, you know, multiracials, across different socioeconomic spectrums. So it was very difficult for industry to come back and say, look, this is just one specific pocket of folks that are being affected. No, this was the community in rural areas uprising during the most difficult of times in a time where workers, if they're speaking out and they lose their job or they get retaliated against, they ain't gonna get another job. These are rural areas where a lot of these plants are the only place where there is work. So we're using that as a moment to say, there's a reason why people are speaking out. This is an emergency and we're able to sort of flag that. So just in short, what happens next? Um, the governor is now kind of given the opportunity to act and he does act, he calls in, the CDC to come to the Eastern Shore and what happens? Everything that we know was going to happen, happened. There was high infection rates um, and resulted in being the highest in the country. And now at that point, we have community worker solidarity. We have our narrative that we've put out and we have the data and science to back it up. So the governor then asked the Department of Labor and Industries to create, create this enforceable standard, which I would be lying if I said that that was not somewhat of a surprise to us, given the fact that Virginia is usually last in labor rights. But really, I think that and we'll get into this a little bit later, you know, when the community is speaking in a, in, a, in a manner of solidarity across all different lines and it's tough for them, uh, you put them in a position where it's tough for them to, um, you know, not not act. So that was coalition one. Coalition two, which obviously interacting in, in, in tandem is, is the inside game right now. It's in front of this board, but we know that there's going to be major pushback. And so, you know, really incredible groups of folks came together that are going to cover every single piece of this. You know, the, the AFL-CIO, AFL other unions, bringing that state and political power and that can go into the technicalities, key players and legislators offices, former OSHA officials, so that we can cut back on this narrative that they're putting out. Um, and just having everyone really, really be a part of the fight and framing it as, look, um, this is a moment to open up the public eyes to what is really going on in the food supply chain. And nobody here is anti-business. We're just pro-worker and we have to celebrate and lift up the voices of these health, these workers that are trying to keep the businesses afloat and support, you know, the broader economy. And so the big picture here uh, is that um, it went down. It was a, there was a short but very robust comment period from the public. There was very strong opposition from industry, um, but they did eventually end up passing the standard. And given that I have like a minute here and I want to be sure that we have time for everybody, um, and I'm happy to follow up with, with anyone, particularly that are trying to do these movements on states and other localities, which has been we have to do because the federal government has not stepped in. Just want to give a, a couple of key lessons, at least that me and my team learned, which was don't, you know, a classic strategy, obviously, is to get folks to divide and conquer um, and, you know, divide in the workplace. And when you're coming at it from multiracial, different socioeconomic spheres, 
not only not allowing them to divide and conquer, but what happened in this instance was you changed that narrative. It was the folks that are traditionally left out of the protections, the immigrant workers, the farm workers, who created this standard that then protected all Virginia workers. So it kind of flipped that narrative on its head. Um, go on the offensive, not the defensive. Um, pick pick the narratives that hit. Like in in a place like Virginia, um, where there's you know a big uh, you know states rights you know historical states rights um, type of flavor. You know we were able to use that in our favor this time, which is like the feds aren't stepping in. Have the state step up and do it. That may not work in your state, um, but it, but it but it but it may um, depending on what that strategy is. And I, given the time constraint here, I, I guess I would just say expect a challenge, forecast in advance, know what's going to happen, and then really never, um, never uh, know the bounds of what can happen with a couple dozen advocates, even a rural area that can really, really change what's going on in the state and across the country. So I'll leave it to the rest of the folks. Hopefully that wasn't <laughs> too quick. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, that was terrific. Um, and again, in case that wasn't uh, too clear to everyone, uh, Virginia was the first state uh, in the country uh, to pass uh, an enforceable uh, standard for worker protections um, around COVID. And again, more information on um, what was done in Virginia um, and other resources as well as all of our contact information is in the Google Doc that I've um, dro just dropped in the chat once again. Um, and um, for um, our final panelist for this session, I would like to introduce James Jones, who is the president of Teamsters Local Union 667 in Memphis, Tennessee, who represents uh, many workers in um, the food supply chain uh, to talk about some things that have been going on um, in Tennessee and the South. So thank you, James. All right, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. Uh, as stated, I'm James Jones, President and Principal Officer of uh, Team 667 in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Memphis is the uh, logistics hub of, a, of America because of the city's central location and the fact that it sits on the Mississippi River. Uh, many companies choose to come to Memphis because of uh, the logistics and distribution uh, here. Um, but mainly I want to talk about Kroger. Kroger is a, a grocery store chain and has a large distribution center here in Memphis. Uh, Kroger is the largest grocery store chain in America. And, you know, with everything that's going on, you probably visited a Kroger in the last couple of months. Uh, you may know it as Fred Myers in the Northwest, uh, Ralph in California, or Harris Teeter in the Carolinas, but Kroger has a reach pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's the second largest general retailer in America, uh, second only to Walmart. Uh, we have a map of the uh, distribu Delta distribution radius. Uh, if we can show that, uh, Teamsters in Memphis supply the food and products to grocery stores and what's called the uh, Delta Division by Kroger. This includes South Missouri, West Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas. Uh, that's almost 9 million people. All of these people are supplied by around 300 workers and 100 truck drivers. So with that in mind, you know, we know the, we know the speed at which COVID-19 can spread. So just imagine if one of those drivers go out to dinner with his family or her family and uh, somehow gets exposed to someone who has uh, COVID-19 or is positive for COVID-19, you know, and they may not know it, they're asymptomatic. Uh, this driver goes to work, goes to the warehouse feeling fine, goes to get their daily job assignment, goes to the break room, tells some jokes, plays around with his coworkers. Just a regular day, nothing's different. Uh, now you have numerous uh, drivers and stores are being supplied by uh, weekly and daily by this driver and the ones that were just uh, sitting around in the break room. And as the virus spreads, Stores are now being supplied by fewer and fewer 
drivers because now they are all infected with the COVID-19. We can break, uh, take that down. Um, so we all remember the toilet paper shortage, um, the meat shortage. So just think about if this was to happen um, at this distribution center here in Memphis. Uh, so now we have a, a commercial appeal article that was written about the distribution center here in Memphis. Um, so we have to remember that Kroger, this is not just an example of something that we're all just thinking of. Uh, when the pandemic first hit, workers in Memphis were exposed and they were literally fearing for their lives and they stood up and refused to enter the facility until the company de-cleaned it. And, you know, I congratulate them for that, for standing up for their rights. Uh, Kroger and the union, you know, we've negotiated several policies and procedures to maintain the crisis. Um, and these, these, these policies go a long way, but, uh, you know, you can't go far enough. Uh, as stated before, you know, Kroger has a union. So you think about the other companies uh, like, like a Walmart and Amazon, where they don't have a union, and uh, we can take that down. And um, they have to rely on the companies to take care of them. But at the same time, these companies are driven by profit, okay? And that's where we say, you know, don't put profit over people, okay? So this is why states must adopt a plan where employers that are trying to do the right thing aren't put at a disadvantage against uh, corporate profiteers, uh, people that are just driven once again by profit. Uh, a plan where workers in this crucial environment have strong enforcement measures that they can use to protect themselves. Uh, because we all know that a right that you can't enforce uh, is really not a right. And that's the STTT plan. Uh, so now we look into September with schools opening, flu season, uh, federal government's general lack of resolve to maintain the um, vigilance against the pandemic. Uh, these workers who are ensuring that the food and other essentials that we rely on daily are facing the clear and present danger. So, you know, we, we know this and we look at it, but we have to really realize how this would affect us if the food supply chain was to go down because of this pandemic. So uh, we need to act sooner than later that uh, this danger could cripple the food supply chain and how that would affect your day-to-day -day life. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, James. Um, that was a really stark picture of you know what the effect can be on the food supply when COVID hit cases hit, hit just one facility um, and how many different states um, that could affect. So thank you. Um, so uh, we have uh, a couple of questions um, for our last few minutes, um, and thank you again to to all of the panelists. Um, uh, for you know, showing across the board um, at all levels, um, you know what is currently happening and and what needs to be done to protect uh, workers and um, and the food supply chain. Um, uh, I, Keith, there's a question for you um, about the STTT program um, and just protections in general. So you know some companies, some localities, some states are, you know, doing better than others um, at enacting, um, you know, most or all of, of these recommendations, um, or at least trying to, but do we know what's working? Um, and, and, you know, have we been able to tell what's working and, and why or why not? Thanks, Alyssa. That's a, a terrific question and, and an important one to answer. Unfortunately, we, we don't know what's working. One of the things that I alluded to at the very end of my talk is we need better data. We need a tracking system. And that's not just you know a, a sort of scientist view on the situation. We need a uniform and systematic plan for tracking cases, for tracking deaths, and for tracking interventions to protect workers. I mean, these are the data that we need to understand what can be effective 
and to identify places where we need to try something different because what we're doing isn't working. Um, you know, I, I was encouraged to see that the state of Michigan very recently mandated that all food and agricultural workers should be tested, but we want to know what the impact of that statewide mandate is, because if it does pay dividends, then maybe other states should be doing exactly the same thing. You know, the, the novelty of this virus and, and the notion that we're kind of learning more about it in real time means that we need to pay close attention to the things we're trying to protect workers to see what really benefits people and, and what doesn't have an effect at all. So so I guess bottom line, can't say it enough, we need to collect data. And I, I get it that uh, there is differential willingness uh, to be transparent with the data, but it says a lot that the best estimates we have of the burden of morbidity and mortality in the industry come from uh, a, a, an investigative news site that has called news reports and, and not from a, a federal or state level official established tracking system. We need, we need to do better and we can, we can. Could I make a quick note on that just on the ground? I'll keep it very short. Just, uh, that's a great point. Uh, on the ground, I can't tell you how many workers, both in agricultural world, food processing all around, want testing, right? What's the issue? They say, we want to get tested, but if we get tested and we uh, get COVID, then we have to go off and we won't get paid leave because the federal laws leave us out for companies under 50 and over 500. So then they're left with a decision of go into work and be able to feed your family but get sick or don't go into work, possibly lose your job and then not be able to feed your family. So that's a tremendously difficult concern and one that we need to be pushing back on and one that workers all want the testing, but they also have to be able to feed their families and they're in a position right now where they can't be able to do both. Yes, absolutely. Um, and if anybody else has, uh, any of the, of the panelists have a follow-up comment on that, feel free to to chime in, but um, thank you both. Um, and then um, Jason, I think this um, question um, is, is for you um, in terms of um, your experience um, in Virginia, um, were there any um, obstacles that came up when you were fighting for this um, standard that you didn't expect or were surprised by? Mm. How long do I have? <laughs> no, I mean, look, I, you have to have every single piece in motion and look like that. I've, I talked about sort of coalition one on the front ground organizing and then on the background. And I'm very confident that if like, it, it was a beautiful way in which it came together. Um, but I'm very confident that without each of those steps as to how they happen, then one piece would not, one, removing one piece may have taken the uh, efficiency and the effectiveness of it out, whether it was the multiracial organizing, whether it was not having folks on the back end to be able to influence board members, whether it was how to react to this, um, you know, uh, terrible article that it came out in the Richmond Times Dispatch from the industry basically saying that enforceable standards would actually make it worse for workers. Um, so really you have to have the team on and ready on, on every single level. And that's really difficult because coalition building, especially in a fast manner is tough and you don't know when to build more with a coalition or when to just go ahead and act. But I would say that in this current moment, get people on board as quickly as you can from all those different sectors, all those different skill sets, and just figure out a way, way to do it in the most efficient way as possible in a way that works in your locality, in your state. I know that's pretty, pretty general, but really um, you have to get creative in terms of thinking about what's gonna, what's gonna work where and who's gonna be the primary pushback. I'd like to add something uh, just from uh, Memphis. Um, it's been amazing to me how some of these companies have, like you said, pushed back from some of these standards and wanting to take care of their employees. Um, you know, we've used a lot of political pressure, uh, union coalitions, uh, drive-bys, uh, you know, as far as caravans, just media attention on a lot of these companies. And some of that is, uh, has, has helped. Uh, we launched a very aggressive uh, plan to get hazard pay and uh, pay leave. And um, the majority of the companies jumped on board. We still had probably about uh, five to 10 that, you know, just refused to do it. 
And um, just to show you how they, some companies uh, just basically are looking at profit, we actually had a plan set up to where we could get someone to come in and test all of their employees. But the companies refused, right? You would think they would want to know, but they re they refused. But they refused because they feared that the majority of their employees would test positive, and they would have to shut down. Think about that. That lets you know how important you are, right? That's an excellent point, um, and. Um a very depressing story that a company would refuse, but um, excellent point about the importance of workers and their power um, if they use it. So thank you. I also have um, uh, another question, um, which is about um, undocumented workers, um, which is how are undocumented workers handling the overlapping issues of dangerous working conditions um, while also not qualifying for COVID relief and being at risk of being targeted by immigration enforcement. Um, Jason, this might be another good one for you. I mean, yeah, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, in, in some ways, it, it really swung both ways in terms of what we've seen. It's adding another level of, um, you know, fear and potential retaliation in terms of what workers are really facing, have historically faced, and have now been feeling the, the pressure on in the last several years. Um, and and it's, been, it's been terrible because they feel less, less likely to, uh, or, or they feel as though they're not able to speak out. And that's really, really tricky. So at the same time, uh, COVID has, and I think this is part of the spirit of what we're talking about on this call, COVID has been terrible for basically every way for everyone, including all these workers that we're talking about. But if it's done one thing, at least in my practice over the last, you know, just sort of a decade, there's really been few folks in the media and otherwise that reach out affirmatively to talk about workers' rights and people in the food supply chain. It's always us trying to get it in the news. Well, now it's kind of the opposite, right? We do have a bit of an opportunity to flag these issues in a, in a really big manner. And so I think that it's really bringing to attention, not just how this is affecting, right, undocumented workers, but workers in general, and is exposing a lot of these bad press, exposing how they're discriminated against, is exposing how those folks are even more vulnerable and how they are the folks that are, without them, the food supply chain would, would be dead. And so I think that if we're able to use this as a moment Right for short term gains like the Virginia standard and other gains that we've talked about on folks with this call that have been amazing. But to use them as a hey, this is the foundation of the system. Maybe we might be able to get to dismantle a lot of these systems that have held them down and uh, be able to make some really substantive change going forward. So trying to be uh, as gla cup or glass half full as possible in a difficult time. Thank you. Um, well, our, our time is just about up. So I think we'll, we'll end on that note um, a little bit more of a positive one um, of uh, using this crisis um, as an opportunity, um, not only to uh, protect all workers, um, especially those essential workers, um, such as those uh, who work in the food supply chain, um, but also communities and um, making that link um, between protecting workers and protecting all of us um, since that food supply chain affects everyone. Um, so again, I'm gonna drop the um, resource list and panelist contact information um, in, uh, oh, it's already, it's already there. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, is in that Google Doc in the chat. Um, so again, I want to thank all of our panelists today. Um, James Jones from Teamsters Local 667, um, Jason Yarshez from the Legal Aid Justice, Justice Center, uh, Dr. Keev uh, Nackman from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Matt Brown uh, from Teamsters. Um, and again, thank you to our colleague, Andrew Lara for um, editing the video that you saw at the beginning of the session. Um, so thanks again, everyone. Thanks to all of 
uh, our attendees who came and um, enjoy uh, the rest of the conference. Stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for attending today. <laughs>